Okay, welcome, welcome, for real. Um, welcome everyone, thank you for coming to our first MFA program on Zoom, or program event on Zoom, or it might not be the first, I wasn't here last spring when all of this fell upon us very suddenly. Um, we are here again, um, apart but together. Um, it's great to see all your faces. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your last night of your summer break um, to launch the fall semester with our annual fall faculty reading. It's very odd to have a fall event on uh, during a heat wave, but then again, that's falls are just odd in general in the Bay Area, as you know, or if you've just moved here, as you'll soon find out. Um, it's not quite a hayride and a harvest pumpkin picking season. Our next reader is Lauren Markham, who has been teaching nonfiction in the MFA program for about three years now. Her first workshop had just four students in it, uh, a micro workshop really. Some of you watching may have been in that workshop and from what I heard, Lauren made it just an incredible class. So we knew we had somebody good in our, in our midst. Uh, Lauren is the author of The Faraway Brothers, Two Young Migrants in the Making of an American Life, another winner of the Northern California Book Award. So we're two for two on that one. Where to go, faculty. Uh, the Faraway Brothers was also long listed for the Pen American Literary Award and the LA Times Book Award. And her shorter work has appeared in Harper's, Guernica, Orion, the New York Times, and v, uh, Virginia Quarterly Review, or VQR, where she's a contributing editor. She also has an essay in the current issue of the San Francisco-based lit mag Ziziva, which if you don't know, you should check out soon, called Cathedrals of Hope, about voting rights and the legacy of the women's suffrage movement. Lauren holds an MFA from the Vermont College of Fine Arts and now lives in the East Bay. And this semester, she's teaching the History of Nonfiction seminar for us. So please visually uh, welcome Lauren Markham. Thank you all so much. And thank you to Busby. Um, it's a really, it's truly an honor to be reading with my fellow readers tonight and just to be a part of this um, USF community. So thanks so much. Um, so I'm going to read an excerpt from uh, a, a newer a book I'm working on. Um, it comes somewhere in the first third of the book. I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, and I think all you really need to know at this point is that um, uh, it's 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 sort of like um, a little bit of a multi interdisciplinary work that I'm still try sort of trying to figure out, but I'm reading you a narrative section. And I think all you really need to know is that I'm in Greece um, and for like several days I haven't really slept. We decided to exchange our last day in Athens for a trip to a nearby island where we'd hopefully find some breeze. To make the most of our day, we left for Hydra early, scant sleep again, and crammed into the hold of the flying dolphin, a low riding ferry whose cabin was kept so frigid with air conditioning that I had to wrap myself in all of our towels. The ferry took two hours. I tried to sleep but couldn't on account of the cold. We exited the boat to a tranquil horseshoe harbor where elaborately festooned donkeys stood at attention, waiting to be loaded up with goods and suitcases and newly arrived guests. There were no cards on Hydra, only donkeys and the occasional golf cart and one's own two feet. There was also no water source. All the island's water had to be shipped in. But Hydra was a heavenly Greece I'd seen in pictures. Women dressed in sun hats and drapey linen sheaths, whitewashed stone buildings, shady cafes, a place of buoyancy and ease, as if the island itself were afloat and drifting. We ate breakfast by the pier while studying a rudimentary tourist map, its pathways drawn in thick cartoonish lines. If we continued down the southern side of the island for a few miles, we would pass a number of beaches. And if we kept going, we would hook eastward, taking the long way back to town. This loop, which we estimated to be about six miles, would take us through a series of smaller towns that dotted the map's bright red line like a string of beads. It would only take us a few hours. We finished our breakfast, I slurped the last of my coffee, and we asked our waitress if we might fill our two small bottle, bottles of water. Two bottles should be enough. The first few miles followed an easy stone pathway along the sea past restaurants and cafes, the shoreline speckled with bathers. Eventually the path turned to dirt, then emptied out into a small south-facing harbor. There were no people there or any shops or restaurants, just a few sparse houses and some boats bobbing near shore. We knew the road wound uphill from here, so we decided to jump in once more before our ascent. The bright, cool sea enveloped us, but as I swam, I noticed that the bleached rocks beneath us were studded with black urchins, their spiny silhouettes catching the light through the water, winking at us like sinister jewels. I insisted that we doggy paddle up the boat ramp until we were near, near enough to shore so as not to accidentally step on one. 
Ben rolled his eyes at me, but went along with the plan. I was always being overly fearful about things, particularly when the ocean invo was involved. In truth, Ben didn't know the half of it. We dried and continued along the path, or what we thought was the path. We passed a few houses, simple block-like structures made mostly of cinder block and stone. The gardens were dry and mostly overgrown. We saw a ruddy-faced man sitting alone through one window at a plastic card table, drinking a can of beer. His eyes raised to meet ours, but lowered again before we could wave. Soon, the path turned to brush. We tried another route. That, too, led to nowhere. Ben pointed up to hill, the hill to where a path cut clean as a lance through the yellowed grasses. We walked toward it, watching our step, but when we looked up again, it had vanished. Where the path should have been was only more rubbly rocks and dried grasses that, when the breeze came, hissed like snakes. We turned back toward the harbor, passing the man in the window, who was now on his second can of beer. Again, there was the road up ahead, and again, it disappeared, leaving us in a confounding nowhere. I was already so thirsty and glugged down some water. Eventually, the man walked out of his house, a knapsack slung over his shoulder. Episcopi, he said, which we recognize as the name of the town up the hill. Yes, we told him, yes, yes. He showed us the way, so easy, so smoothly found that we couldn't quite figure how we'd ever managed to be lost. We set off, off, the, hill, off the hill through a cooling thicket of pines, our small bottles almost empty, but we'd purchase some more water once we reached the town. The houses we passed seemed long abandoned as if from another century, or perhaps from a time when this country wasn't drowning in debt. For sale, read a hand scrawled sign in both English and Greek. Soon we saw no houses at all. At the top of the hill, the forest emptied into broad dry escarpment with a view of the sea in all directions. It wasn't so much a town, but something closer to a ruin. There was no one else around and certainly no water for sale. I'd had too much coffee and now our bottles were empty, the sun lavishing itself wherever it pleased. My head hurt. I found some shade in the town's three -walled at the town's three-walled chapel and closed my eyes, but was soon startled by a sudden racket. A herd of goats was running toward me, bells clanging against their chest. Further on, we encountered a group of tourists, also from the States, coming from the other direction. It's quite a hike, one of them said, eyeing my outfit, a breezy sundress, black Converse sneakers I'd bought years ago at a consignment shop for eight bucks. You guys gonna be okay? I resented the suggestion. I was more rugged than I looked. They offered some of their water to us, but we politely refused. Our march resumed over an open terrain of low scrub. It was roughly 1 p.m. by now, with hardly any shade to be found. We'd been hiking for three hours. Perhaps there'd be another town, one with water, up ahead. At the base of the cliffs far below was a pristine shady beach where a few swimmers floated along an anchored water taxi, its bright red stripe jarring and unreal in this landscape of parch. We considered taking the path down there as if somewhere between them and us was a hatch through which we could slip off the sizzling moonscape and back into the day we had imagined for ourselves. But it was at about a mile and a half away. We had no cell service. What if the boats were gone by the time we made it down? We kept going. I thought of the tourists, our stupid refusal of their water. We ascended and summited, ascended and summited again. Anytime we stopped, ravenous green horseflies swarmed us and bit. We looked at the map again. After two hours, we were, in fact, where I thought we'd been several hours before. I thought of the poem, The Wasteland, something about water and no rock and stopping to drink, but I couldn't recall the exact order of the words. Eventually, another crumbling church came into view. I took a seat against its back wall, trying to small myself enough to disappear into its thin triangle of shade. I was woozy, my eyesight blurred with splotches of black. My legs were wobbly. I'd hardly been seated an instant before I spontaneously started peeing, unable to stop myself before it was too late. This is when I announced about the time I peed my pants to the entire USF uh, MFA program. You're welcome. <laughs> you peed, Ben said. This sometimes happened, he knew from his marathon days, when the body began to shut down. But he didn't say this to me. Instead, we just laughed uneasily and studied the terrible map. All the towns we had imagined were just this, crumbling stones, stray goats, some unconjurable past there'd be no water. Eventually, we began sloping slightly downhill. Finally, I thought, toward town. The path narrowed and narrowed some more. The spiny brush began to scratch my legs, drawing blood. I snatched something from my face, jilting backward. What's wrong, Ben asked as I opened my hand, revealing an enormous black spider, its body the size of a dime, its legs sleek and knuckled as if clad in gleaming armor. This spider, sturdy and mammalian, felt like a tiny omen. I flung it into the brush, and we began laughing. What more signs did we need that we'd slipped into some other realm, into a current of sinister unreal? It was too late to do anything about it. 
The more we walked, the more spiders we encountered. Their webs stretched stretch across the narrowing path, and we had to bend and duck to avoid them. Surely no one had walked this trail for some time. Where were we? Again, the path was gone. I took a seat. On cue, the horse flies appeared. Ben set off to figure out where we'd gone wrong and how to meet back up with the trail. Who knows how long we'd been walking astray. I was now seated atop the scrub, the horse flies feasting on my legs, too weary to swat them. I know how pathetic it sounds and I knew it then, but the truth was I could barely move my arms. I closed my eyes, imagining the darkness behind my lids was a kind of shade and fell asleep while the flies feasted. Here there was no rock, or here there was no water, but only rock, rock and no water and a sandy road, the road winding above the mountains, which are mountains of rock without water. If there was water, we should stop and drink. Amongst the rocks, one cannot stop or think. I lurched myself awake. How long had Ben been gone? The bites on my legs were already swelling. I called for him, but was immediately unsure if I'd made much of a sound. So I gathered my strength and screamed his name. Nothing. I pictured him getting bit by a snake, twisting his ankle, hitting his head. And what would I be able to do to help him? I recognized the absurdity of my thought pattern, but then again, wasn't this its own tired story? Moronic tourists lose their way. I knew a writer who died of heat stroke on assignment. He was a young man, strong, an adventurer in body and spirit. Within just a few minutes of passing out, he was dead. Where the hell was Ben? Where the hell was I? Finally, Ben reappeared. I was shouting for you, I practically screamed. I was shouting for you, he replied. Hadn't I heard him? He hadn't been all that far, but here the rules of ordinary reality did not apply. We turned around. At the top of the hill, the view of the town of Hydra town came into view, so close, so far, but soon the path vanished again. When I realized this, I began to tremble. If there was rock and also water, a water, a spring, a pool among the rock, if there were only the sound of water, not the cicada and dry grass singing. Up on that mountain, I understood I had not only entered a mythological landscape, but was also enacting a personal mythology. I couldn't shake that something was being revealed to me, something about my own fragility and how easily the veil of realism could be pierced. It was as though I was being tested, encountering the monsters and the monstrous obstacles in the world, but mostly within myself. Eventually, we found a way. We lowered down the hill on what appeared to be an improvised goat trail. The closer the town came into view, the more I disbelieved, as if any minute the trail would once again shoot us back upward, the town slipping from our sights. But soon we were walking past inhabited houses upon a veritable stone path, which eventually became a road that led to still more houses, their manicured gardens some insistence of civilization. Ben quickly began knocking on doors to ask for water, but no one answered. Eventually he found a hose. I held my breath as he turned the tap. Water, it flowed so easily as if it were nothing. I drank greedily, then handed the hose to Ben and we traded like this, gasping for several minutes. Let's go, he said, once our bottles were filled. He had some notion that we might make the ferry and get the hell out of here. But even I, from within my heat stroke, knew that our ferry was long gone. There was no rush now, and I needed to leave an offering of some kind. I rummaged around in my backpack for a few Euro coins, which I placed gently by the tap, saying some sort of stupid, sun-addled prayer before turning around to catch up to Ben. Soon, we were back at the harbor. The boats bobbed, the tourists licked their gelatos, the elderly men drank their coffee without hurry. It was 5.30 p.m. The next ferry wasn't until nine. We bought water, then two overpriced lemonades, then two more lemonades, and walked down to one of the rocky beaches. We jumped into the water, the chill of it so abrupt, it felt as though our skin might cool to us like lava. It turned out that we had walked nearly 15 miles in 90 degree heat. I still felt ashamed at my frailty, how narrowly I'd passed whatever test I'd been given. Ben changed into pants and I pulled on the silken black dress I'd stuffed to the bottom of my backpack. Like that, we were transformed. We found a restaurant that overlooked the sea and ate one of the most delicious meals we'd ever had. How was it so easy to slip from one reality into another? Money. We paid the bill. There was still some time before the ferry took off, so we sat on the cliff's edge, watching as the hor horizon held, excuse me, as the horizon hauled down the sun like a sail. It was beautiful. But Hydra is a many-headed snake. Just as we were feeling ourselves again, one of those thick black spiders dropped just inches from our faces, hovering on its glossy line so that it was perfectly silhouetted by the blazing orange sun. Thank you.